Matt, uh, uh, Matt gave a message carrying us through uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, 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 all the way down, I think through, uh, it was like to, was it 25, Matt? To the end. To the end, okay, so all the way to the end. And this week we're going to be focusing on uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but we're going to, at, at first we're going to uh, do a little bit of a recap because we're starting right in the middle of a thought here in... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through uh, this all the way through chapter 2, and then we're going to go back and, and uh, uh, take a look at, at, uh, at these passages. So starting at verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise are called according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Uh, turn to chapter 2, verse 1. And, so here we see that we're continuing a thought here. And I, brethren... When I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of, of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the hearts of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is right, rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? 
but we have the mind of Christ. So let's all turn back to um, back to chapter one, verse eighteen. And in this whole passage, uh, all of chapter uh, two, and and this part uh, from verse eighteen in chapter one, uh, what Paul here is doing is he's showing the difference. You know, uh, he's comparing the difference between the wisdom of man, earthly wisdom, versus. Uh, godly wisdom and then he reveals to us what that godly wisdom is um, so if, if we look at uh, verse uh, 18 it says for those for the message of the cross is full foolishness to those who are perishing but to those who are being saved is the power of God and uh, you know this is one of the things that the ancient Greeks and the Romans themselves who didn't want to receive the word of God. They thought it was foolishness to hear the message of the cross that, that, that God became a uh, man. He incarnated as a man to die for the sins of the world. And it was something that they couldn't understand, you know, because the, the wisdom of the world uh, thinks that you have to do something in order to earn something. And, you know, what we know from scripture is, is that we do not earn our salvation. You know, we simply receive it as a free gift uh, through faith. Uh, verse 19, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And again, this, this has to do with worldly wisdom. I mean, there's so many different aspects of worldly wisdom. You have, you know, uh, the philosophy of men. You have uh, the, the various world religions and their ideas of spirituality. You also have... Um, um, you know, just different different concepts of science. You know, science is is great. I mean, we we have uh, so much that's been given to us. We have through science, we're able to have machines that harvest our crops and do all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, human science is limited by by just the material nature of of the world, and and uh, there's so much missing from from what God, the fullness of God's creation, right? So God, uh, he created, Jesus created all things, both visible and invisible. So there's things that, uh, about the creation uh, that are not visible to all of us, that when we understand them, we get a fuller understanding of, of God and his purpose in his creation. Um, and again, the, the, the wisdom of man also, there is the, the philosophies of men, you know, which... You know, we also, we have uh, the philosophies of men regarding to just natural philosophy uh, and, you know, atheistic philosophies. We also have spiritual philosophies and even science itself, you know, every science, it doesn't matter which one of them, uh, all has some philosophy behind it. There's also some guiding principle of philosophy. Uh, and some of them are more based on hard, hard science, and some of them are based more on men's philosophy. Um, and then there's also the, the philosophy of the, the, what the world continue, con considers to be spiritual, right? So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, Paul here reveals what it means to be spiritual. What's the true meaning of of, of what it means to be spiritual, he that is spiritual, uh, versus uh, the world. Uh, the world has all these different things, either you know through religion, where you where man works his way uh, to his own salvation, or you have like secret, uh, the secret wisdom of the Gnostics or, or the ancient mystery schools from the from the various uh, uh, Gentile nations. Um, uh, which are all uh, basically just the, the deep things of Satan. You know, it, it's, it's Satan who, who rules the world, rule, rules its cultures, and rules its, its, uh, its religions. So uh, let's move on to um, verse... Oh, let's, let's read through here. We're going to read uh, verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world. For since the wisdom of God, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, 
It pleased God through the foolishness of the message priest to save those who believe. So there is no salvation in the wisdom of the world. Men are proud about what they know, people that have their you know, uh, degrees. And there's something you know, uh, that you know, the, the society teaches, you know, to have pride and bragging rights about whatever they accomplish and whatever they do. And, and, uh, but God's gonna bring all those things to nothing. You know, there's, there's nothing that, uh, that in this world of itself uh, adds up to anything worth uh, the kingdom of God. So in verse uh, 22, for the Jews request a sign and Greeks seek, seek after wisdom. And what this verse here is saying is that uh, the Jews were always looking for some kind of a sign uh, to prove uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. The problem is, is it didn't matter how many signs he would give them. They just wouldn't believe. And one of the problems why they wouldn't believe is because they just weren't ready for him. You know, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the Judaism that we see at the time when Jesus arrived had already changed drastically, right? From the Mosaic Judaism that we see you know, when we read through the Old Testament and, and we see the Israelites in the desert with Moses. Uh, it, when we read through the Old Testament, we get to the end of Malachi, you know, suddenly there's a gap there. It's about 400 years. And then we move on to uh, the first book of the New Testament, which is Matthew. And suddenly you see there's Pharisees and Sadducees. And, you, and you know, there's, it's like, wait a minute, where do these guys come from? Because we never heard about them in the Old Testament. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's revealed that, you know, there was a, a split that happened, you know, during the, the time of the Maccabees, where uh, the Jewish leaders had uh, turned to uh, an oral Torah that they had been developing, that the rabbis had been developing. And they, that's kind of the direction they went. They started creating all these extra laws and expounding on the laws that were given to them, so much so to the point that you know, when Jesus arrived, they, they, they were completely off in the weeds, you know, and they weren't ready for him. They, they weren't following prophecy. They had their own ideas, their own uh, uh, philosophies of, of what they thought the Messiah was going to bring. So they weren't ready for him. They didn't see him coming when, you know, the prophecies of his coming were clearly given to them. Um, the Greeks here in verse 22 for the Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Again, the, the Greeks used to love to debate uh, philosophy. And a lot of that philosophy came from um, worldly nature and understanding man, you know, just in a worldly state. But one of the problems with, with men's philosophy, it, it, it looks at man and the heart of man and the mind of man through the lens of there being no God, just what we, what, what we see in nature. You know, so it's missing so much of, of what God has created man to be, the fallen state of man, and all of those things that are revealed to us in Scripture. Um, but in verse 23, Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. Right? And this is the main heart of the whole message right here. You know, between the, the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God, right, is, is, is this preaching that Christ was crucified, that he was crucified and that by his blood, you know, we are, we are saved, those who have faith in him. Um, let's turn to verse 24 here. Uh, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world which are uh, despised 
God has chosen. So the base things that are despised, these are the things that the world thinks are useless. And what does the world think that's useless today? It's the, the gospel. They think the gospel is useless. What does the, the world think is, is um, wonderful? You know, it's riches and power and wealth and, and status and all of these things. Those are the things that the world thinks are valuable. Um, but the most valuable thing a human being can ever receive in this, in this world is salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the, the most number one important thing. And also says here in verse 20, it says, And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to, to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And I guess glory, the, the word glory here is, is, um, is to boast, right? So, you know, worldly man likes to boast in all of his accomplishments, but, you know, no one's going to be able to boast when they stand before God because all men are sinners. All men are sinners and no one is worthy. And those who have received Christ um, will be able to stand in righteousness before the Lord, but not because of anything they've done, but only because of what the Lord has done. Uh, verse 30, But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of God, Wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And again, this, these are the works of, uh, of Jesus, right? So Jesus became the wisdom from God and the righteousness. It, it, he lived a perfect, righteous life. And by receiving the, the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, we, we have his righteousness imputed on us and sanctification. The moment you believe, you are sanctified. You are set apart by God. That's what sancti sanctification means. Sanctified means set apart. And you have a positional sanctification in the heavens that you receive simply by believing in the gospel. And then redemption. You know, we are saved. Our sins have all been wiped away uh, and paid for by the debt of Jesus' blood on the cross. Let's uh, turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. So starting in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See that all of that you receive just by, by faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? So here we're tied back to uh, 1 Corinthians. Where's the boasting? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gen uh, also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the uh, the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So if we are not under the law, we see that here that Paul says we establish the law, right? And it's because the law is still very, very important. The law points uh, every sinner to the need for a savior. And it shows the sinner his sin. 
so that he knows what his sin is. Um, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, and I just read that passage there at the, uh, on verse 31, the very last. Uh, it says that, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the, in the Lord. That's he who boasts, let him boast only in the Lord, right? Because the Lord has paid it all. He has done it all. He has done the, the works of salvation. So now let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. So, you know, what Paul is saying here is, you know, he didn't use these fancy words. You know, he wasn't trying to uh, impress people with his oratory skills or his uh, ability to debate, right? Um, there were others that were better at, at they're better at Paul than this, like Apollos was well known for being a, a great, great speaker. You know, and Paul, uh, what he says here is in verse two, for I determined to know, uh, to not know anything amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? Again, that's back to the focus of Jesus, Jesus on the cross and him crucified. The greatest thing, you know, the message that anyone on, in this world can hear and receive. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and the power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, right? So again, Paul's just making the point here that, you know, it wasn't through him being able to persuade you through arguments but just in the power of God and hearing the word of God and God calling you when you hear that word um, is the power of God there that, uh, that was given to Paul as he was, he was given gifts. And one of those gifts uh, was that of prophecy and prophecy also just the delivery of God's message. Um, verse six, for we speak wisdom among those who mature Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of the, this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. And uh, this is a very important passage right here. Um, at the beginning of verse six, it says, however, we speak wisdom amongst, uh, among those who are mature. So uh, mature are those who, who have developed they're no longer babes in Christ. These are people who, who are growing in their faith. These are people who, who are in the word and, and learning to walk with the Lord. And uh, he says, but we speak in verse seven, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages. And so this mystery, what is this mystery? You know, Paul reveals several mysteries for us, you know, and the, these mysteries pertain to the promises for the church. And it's these promises that the church is to hold on to and look to always in hope. And uh, let's see where we're at here. Let's go to, um, let's turn to find out what some of these mysteries are. In this case right here, we're gonna find out that he's talking about this mystery of Christ, the mystery uh, that Jesus went to the cross, right? Um, Let's go to 1 Corinthians, I mean, 1 uh, uh, Colossians, I'm sorry. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. I'll start at verse one. For I want you to know with a great, uh, what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many have, have not seen my face in the flesh, that in their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attain to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of 
the Father and of Christ. So part of this mystery is just the revealing of the Son, right? That, that, uh, that the Son of God would pay that penalty for, for the sins of the world. Um, let's turn to um, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. So in verse 9, we have a little bit of more of the mystery here. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. So this is one of the other great mysteries, you know, that, that Jesus himself, the creator of all things, would gather all things together in him, both in heaven and on earth. Right? And, and he has already begun this work at the cross, but it'll come to fullness uh, at his second coming uh, when, when he does away with all of his enemies, puts his enemies under his feet, and starts his kingdom. Uh, let's turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. There's another great one right here. Another mystery revealed by Paul. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me, who am less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages had been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So even all the angels and, and the powers and principalities uh, are to make known these things when they were revealed here by Paul in this mystery. According to the eternal purposes which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you, do not lose heart at my uh, tribulations uh, for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he should grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Here's another part of the mystery, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to ex uh, able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever so what's amazing here is that Paul is revealing this mystery that 
that when Christ went to the cross and he bled and, and died on the cross for the, for the sins of man, he also set forth that those who would believe would re receive the indwelling spirit of God, the, uh, the indwelling spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And, and it's through that, it's through that indwelling. That's part of a big mystery there that is so important for every believer to understand. Every believer that's already received the Lord is to understand that God is with you. You are the temple of God, and God dwells in you. And it's, and it's this, this uh, indwelling of God is that that's what empowers us uh, and, and, and does the work through us. Let's look at verse 20 here again. It says, Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Right? Who's him? That's God, right? That's God. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God is working in us. God provides our sanctified walk. Uh, let's turn to Colossians. I'll turn back to Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 25. I'll start at verse 24 here. Verse 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. So this is really important. Important right here. We're learning that the church is the body of Christ, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship. The word stewardship here is dispensation from God which was given to me for you to the fullness of the word of God, the mystery which was hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery among the gen amongst the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Again, here we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So we have a couple things here that Paul is revealing, and one is that the church is the body of Christ. We also have, uh, again, he, he's talking about this mystery of the Gentiles, that the Gentiles are grafted in to the vine, which is Israel. Uh, which is really important to, you know, that we understand that, uh, uh, that, that the Jews did not understand this at all. It was something very difficult for, for many of them to grasp. The, the fact that, that the Gentiles would be grafted in and have all of the same blessings and promises of the church, of the body of Christ that the Jews would have. Um, let's turn to... Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, Ephesians 5.32, actually, let's start at verse 22, <laughs> and he's going to talk about marriage here. And the reason why Paul is talking about marriage is because this relates to the church, the relationship between the church and Christ, right? And, and, it's, and it's this relationship, what he's about to say here is a lesson about the church and, and the church, church's relationship to Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let uh, the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no, uh, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body. Again, he's relating this to the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And this is important because Adam, when, when God created Eve by, by, by using a rib from Adam, what did Adam say? He says, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, right? And here's, this is related directly to that. For we are members of his, that's Jesus's body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. And, and so there is something mysterious about how uh, a husband and wife when they're married, become one flesh. And what does Paul say here? He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, right? So just the same way, the church is the body of Christ. We are one with the Lord. We are part partakers of the divine because we've received the indwelling spirit of God. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 51. Oh, maybe, 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 maybe there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Let's go to verse 50. Verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit uh, incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Again, here we're, an, re, Paul's revealing another mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, O death, where is your sting, O Hades? Where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So here, one of the great mysteries is the glorification of the church being made immortal, right? This is when the church receives their glorified bodies. This is the same body that Christ was resurrected with. He is the first fruit of the resurrection. And he is the first fruit of the resurrection so that he may be the first fruit of many brethren, right? And so this is one of the other mysteries. So the mystery of the indwelling spirit of God, the mystery of salvation through, through Jesus' blood on the cross, the, the mystery of... Uh, of the glorification of the church. And that is what we always look to. And that's why it's so important that we focus on the walk in the spirit and allow God to, to produce our sanctified walk now to, to prepare us and, and move us closer and closer to be like Christ. Uh, because one day we're going to be fully sanctified where we'll no longer have a sin nature. And what a what a beautiful thing. Can you imagine not having a sin nature? Can you imagine never again struggling, you know, with the old man? That would be, to me, it's like one of the, one of the greatest gifts, right? Um, 
Let's turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Again, we have Paul speaking of the mystery here. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles had come in. So, so much of the church out there, I'm talking about the covenant theology church, believes that God is done with Israel. God is not done with Israel. God has a, a plan and purpose for, for Israel he's, to he's, fulfill the land promises that he promised to Israel. And he will. He will. And what we see here in verse 25, it says, um, it says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part... In part. Why in part? Because there are Jews that are coming to salvation. Right? That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And what we have to understand here is the covenant that was made with Abraham was made when Abraham was asleep. That means that it's an unconditional promise. God made this promise to them and he promises to restore them. And there are, are definitely going to be two, two parts uh, to the millennial kingdom. There's going to be those who are glorified, which includes both Jew and Gentile, those are the immortals uh, of, of the kingdom of God. And then you're going to have the mortals. Those are those who, who survive through the great tribulation and enter into Israel. And, and Israel will once again be the head and not the tail uh, over the kingdoms of the earth. And the church will reign and rule with Christ. Um, Let's turn to Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 6. So we all we, we just saw in Romans that that one of those great mysteries is God is not done with Israel. God is not done with Israel. And that's an important one to remember. Because we're to love uh, the people that God loves. Right? And, and the Bible says that, that God has an everlasting love for Israel. You know, if we say that we have the love of God in us, then how could we hate someone who God loves? Right? So we look forward to that day. Today, the, the nation of Israel is still in rebellion against, uh, against the, uh, their Messiah. You know, there are Jews, that, m many, many Jews that are coming to salvation. Um, but there's coming a day when all of, all of Israel will be saved. So here in Galatians 1.6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, if we really important right here, but even if we are an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you. Let him be accursed. Right? So the gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation, uh, the good news, the word gospel means good news. So you have the good news, the gospel of salvation, that's, that's that through faith we receive, the gospel, uh, we receive salvation. Um, but there's also the gospel, the good news of all of these promises that Paul has been giving us in these mysteries. And these promises, we're to hold on to them. And this is how we stand these days. This is how we are able to, to stand with all the troubles in the world, is not to look at the troubles in the world, but look to the promises of God. So again, verse 8. 
Always remember this one, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you that we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Um, and this is for all time. Let's, let's, go, let's find out how long that's, that's in place. Let's go to Hebrew, the book of Hebrews. Let's see if I can find it. Chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and, for, and forever. So his word will be preserved forever. And those things which, which, those promises that God has made are forever. The mysteries he's revealed are forever. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 2.8. So these mystery, the mystery of Jesus going to the cross, paying for the sins of the world, redeeming the entire world is what they didn't understand. It says, verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord, Lord of glory. For it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So... You know, I spoke about this just a little bit earlier in, in the message. Was that they didn't know, they weren't prepared because they had not been preserving and following the word the way they were supposed to be. The leaders and the elders uh, of Israel. But verse 10 it says, But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. What, what's revealed? Let's go back to verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's, that's what's being talked about here in verse 10. The things which God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. And so God revealed through the Holy Spirit to the apostles through prophecy what these mysteries are. That way the apostles could reveal them to us. And then today, we re receive them by the Holy Spirit, by reading the Word, and, and uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The deep things of God are the more mature things. Uh, for what, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? So this verse right here, what it says here, for what a man knows... What, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. This, this means that we can't really know what's in another man's heart, what he's thinking. We can't know any of those things, right? Because only that man's spirit within him knows, knows those things. Um, even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So how can man, how can the natural man even look up and begin to think he even understands God? Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So because of the indwelling spirit of God, we can have a relationship with God. We can commune with God and we can know the mind of God. So let's, uh, uh, so in verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, that's important there, the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. So the spirit of the world is Satan. Satan and the entire uh, fallen angel uh, dominion. All of that, that that's guiding and leading uh, the world systems.
Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this right? 1 John, I'm sorry. That would help. First John chapter four, verse four. This is a real common verse. Most of us are familiar with this verse. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, right? So the Holy Spirit who dwells within us is greater than Satan who rules over the kingdoms of the, of the world. Let's uh, now turn to the next chapter, which is 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Verse 19 says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So Satan guides and leads and controls the nations. He controls the, the, the worldly cultures and he controls and guides the wisdom of the world. So let's turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I mean, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. Back to verse 10. Uh, maybe verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, uh, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Verse 13, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And this is how we know spiritual things, because the Holy Spirit teach, teaches us these things. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. The natural man who does not have the indwelling Spirit of God cannot know the spiritual things of God. He just can't. He'll read the Bible and he'll apply worldly wisdom and all these things to it, his own understanding. He just won't be able to get it. Because they are spiritually discerned, it says here in verse 14. But he who is spiritual, who's he that is spiritual? That's all the believers, right? All the believers are he that is spiritual. Judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one for who has known the mind of the, uh, the who has known the mind of the Lord that they may instruct him but we have the mind of Christ and we have the mind of Christ when we walk in the spirit right and we know that we don't always walk in the spirit we walk in the flesh quite a bit don't we All right so we know we don't always have the mind of Christ but when we walk in the spirit we're promised that we will have the mind of Christ when we're in the word um, let's turn to Hebrews, the, the book of Hebrews. Turn back there. Chapter 4, verse 12. So how does the Holy Spirit teach us? We have the indwelling Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit teaches us, right? And the Holy Spirit teaches us through the Word. When we get a message from God, it's through the Word. It's always through the Bible, right? We're in the Bible, we're reading His Word, and the Holy Spirit is revealing His Word to us. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what's important to understand here is that the Word of God is living and powerful. It is a living Word because it was inspired by the Word of God, and it is taught to us by the indwelling Spirit of God. 
Um, let's turn to James. Book of James, ver chapter 1, verse 5. So the book of James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Right? So if we're having trouble understanding a Bible verse, you pray over it. We should always be praying when we're in, in the Word of God. You know, sometimes it doesn't always come quickly, but we're to be growing, right? We, it's easy. Sometimes we think that we understand something, but we may be in the flesh when we're reading it. So we need to make sure that, you know, we're praying and having the Holy Spirit re reveal. Um, and this doesn't mean, you know, uh, that we shouldn't use, you know, like, like very good tools like sound hermeneutics where we're actually, you know, looking at the, the literal, grammatical, historical meaning of the text. Or that's also called the plain meaning of the text. When I read it, I should be able to read it just like I read anything else. You know, we take the literal interpretation of the Word of God. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, to, chapter 2, I'm sorry. And uh, again, just to recap here at the end as we're, we're in closing here, is, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. So you don't need to argue with non-believers over scripture. They just, they, they can't, they can't grasp it. The, the only thing you can do with them is share the gospel. Share the gospel, don't, don't get in Bible verse wars or you know, into great deep arguments with them because it says right here, you know, but, um, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to them. And we just saw how uh, Paul was talking about the wisdom of the world that those things, th these things are foolish and the Bible and everything it says about God's creation and how it occurred and, and, and God's method of salvation is foolishness to the world. So don't waste your time arguing with non-believers. But he who is spiritual, spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Um, so the cr Christian life is a walk in the Spirit. And belief and rest on the promises of God. So we walk in the Spirit and we believe and rest on the promises of God. And this, that's why it's so important for us to, for every Christian to know what are those promises. Go look at all these mysteries. Learn what they are. Learn what the promises of God are so that you can, you can have confidence and rest on those in faith. Also learn what the, the, the fruit of the Spirit are. Because that's a guide to find out, are we walking in the Spirit? Are we producing this fruit? Like the, the, the Spirit of love, I mean, the, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, one of them being love, right? So the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So where's the self-control coming from? From God. God is producing the self-control, right? And we receive it by faith. So if, if, if we're not producing this fruit, then that means that, you know, at that moment, we're not yielded and walking in the Spirit, right? And it, it's something that the, the believer should be doing is growing more and more so that more and more every day, every month, every year, that we're walking in the Spirit more and more and allowing God to produce these things through us, right? And understand that all of these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, these are not the natural man's type of love or joy or peace. This is divine love. This is a, a, a non-believer. They, they can love. They love their family. They love their, their, uh, their kids. They, you know, they're able to love one another. They're able to love their neighbor. But this kind of love here, when we're... we're bearing the fruit of the Spirit. This is divine love. This is the love of God that only God can produce, that God produces through our heart when we're walking in the Spirit. And this is a type of love, joy, and peace that the non-believer can never experience until they receive the Lord.